Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Greetings and welcome and thank you for coming to this presentation of the E. Pauline Ryle Lecture Series. My name is Janet Dudley Eschbach, and I'm president of Salisbury University. And you know, we talk a lot about how Salisbury is a Maryland University of national distinction. It is, in fact, events like this evening and the caliber of the speakers who come to Salisbury uh, that help contribute to that reputation, a reputation that continues to grow pretty dramatically. The Ryle Committee has once again succeeded in bringing to campus a timely and thought-provoking speaker. He's a nice guy, too. We were able to chat a little bit uh, over dinner, and I think we're in for a treat tonight. Uh, and I know that we all look forward to hearing the insights that Dr. Daniel Willingham presents this evening. My thanks to Dr. Cheryl Parks, Dean of the Seidel School of Education and Professional Studies, and especially tonight, Dr. Keith Connors, Chair of the Ryle Committee, for their excellent work. Uh, it takes a lot to make these Ryle events happen, and uh, I know that Dr. Connors has been uh, probably eager to get his life back here. Um, but thank you very much, Keith. And of course, I'd especially like to thank Dr. William Hamm himself for joining us this evening. And so without further delay, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Cheryl Parks, again, Dean of the Seidel School, to the podium. Thank you. Hello, and good evening, and welcome. Um, my name is Cheryl Parks. I am the new dean of the um, Seidel School of Education and Professional Studies, which is in some ways the uh, child of the school that Pauline Ryle uh, taught in and was principal of. I had the opportunity when I first arrived on campus to be given a book that uh, recapped some of the history of uh, the campus and the normal school that Pauline Ryle was, um, was principal of. Actually, she was a third and fourth grade teacher, then a sixth grade teacher, and then the principal. At any rate, as I was reading through that book, I came upon a number of different names, and it was one of those experiences as a new person to say, wow, I know that name, because there was a William Holloway, and he was a principal, and he was the name, this, is, this building is his, is his namesake. And Thomas Carruthers was a math teacher, and Oh, I got to put on my glasses, I'm sorry. And Jefferson Blackwell was the president. And then Ben Maggs was a physical education instructor at the normal school. And then there was Pauline Ryle. And do you notice she was the only woman in that bunch? So this is a woman who had a lot of vision. And she, out of that vision, created the scholarship and the fund that um, is responsible for this lecture series. And I just want to read to you a brief excerpt from an article that was written about her shortly after her death. Uh, for 40 years, E. Pauline Ryle, teacher, then principal of the campus demonstration school at Salisbury State College, made educating children her life. For friends and colleagues, it comes as no surprise, therefore, that this conscientious educator who di died last October, this was October of 1986, was, has willed approximately 300,000, the bulk of her estate, for scholarships and educational programs at what was then Salisbury State College. Her money came from the college, and that's where she wanted to leave it, said one of her friends. She lived, slept, and ate education. So that's the namesake for which this lecture is being sponsored, and I know that you will enjoy it. I know that Dr. Willingham has something really great to say, and so at this point, welcome, enjoy, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Keith Connors. Dean Parks mentioned Ben Maggs. When I joined the faculty in 1976, I took the faculty position that Ben Maggs had just retired from. So it gives you an idea how old I am, anyway. <laughs> Thanks to everyone for supporting the Ryle Lecture Program, as you do every semester. 
It's a testament to our students' commitment to their profession and to our, edu and our educational community on East Maryland's Eastern Shore that we can fill this place to the rafters once again on a Tuesday night. Before I introduce the speaker, I want to acknowledge some of the people who make this possible. Would the members of the Ryle Committee in the Seidel School please stand? And that would be Claudia Burgess, Kim McCormick, Ron Sires, Ted Gilkey, and Brandy Terrell. Thank you so much for helping to keep. <laughs> Special thanks, too, to someone who could not be here tonight, but really was the glue that held this all together. And that's Melinda Munn in the Dean's Office of the Seidel School. She was terrific with all the logistical details. Our chapter of Kappa Delta Pi, the International Honor Society for Education, has supplied the ushers and the people who are selling books in the lobby. And our speaker will be happy to sign a copy if you would like to follow him to the reception, which will take place in the social room down the hall after the speech tonight. Several campus offices also played important roles that we want to thank. Thank facility reservations, catering, public relations, publications, TV production, public safety, horticulture for the ferns, and event services. And as he always does, Matt Hill of Event Services, who's in the back, has <clears throat> told me that he wired the auditorium. So if your cell phone should go off in the next hour or so, your GoNet course selections will give you nothing but 8 o'clock classes next semester. <laughs> as, uh, as noted in the program, the uh, Ryle Lecture Series is in its 26th year at Salisbury University. And the program indicates the lecture is just part of the legacy that Dean Parks talked about. Pauline Ryle gave uh, to the university some money for scholarships for this lecture series and an award given to the outstanding elementary or early childhood education major each year. The names of the award winners uh, appear in the program. Now, if you've looked at the program, you've read that our speaker, Daniel Willingham, holds a bachelor's degree from Duke and a PhD from Harvard in cognitive psychology. And he's been a professor at the University of Virginia since 1992. I spent some time recently looking over his credentials, what we in higher education call a curriculum vitae. There are hundreds of publications, speeches, presentations listed there, and many of them sound not nearly as stuffy as you might expect from an eminent scholar in cognitive science. Listen to some of the titles of the things that he has written. Six reasons why arts education is more than a luxury. Do Southpaws rule the world? The myth of learning styles. Is it true that some people just can't do math? Why students think they understand when they don't? And perhaps his best known title comes from a book that actually started out as an article uh, that was honored in, 19, or excuse me, in 2009 as the best learned article by the Association of Educational Publishers, titled why students don't like school. Besides doing all of this writing, he has twice been honored with the University of Virginia's All University Outstanding Teaching Award. In recent years, uh, Dr. Willingham's scholarly work has focused on applying what cognitive science has learned to P16 classrooms, what we as teachers actually can benefit from. Over lunch today, after I picked him up at the airport, he confided to me that some of his colleagues at the University of Virginia are not great fans of this applied stuff. They like the theoretical pure research that that kind of institution likes to cultivate. Kind of sounds like the uh, Dr. Sheldon Cooper of the Big Bang Theory. <laughs> well, at SU, we are, we are all about informed and reflective practice based on that solid research. So Dr. Willingham, tonight <clears throat> you're going to be talking to an audience not of Sheldon Cooper's, but of Leonard Hofstetter's and Howard Wolowitz's. <laughs> eager to tackle the real-life challenges of teaching and learning. Welcome to Salisbury University. Uh -huh. Well, thank you all very much for that warm welcome, and, and thanks very much, Keith, for that uh, kind introduction. So as you can see, the title of my talk is, is slightly stuffy. Um, uh, I confess that initially the, the title that I considered was as an educational researcher, how come no one listens to me? Um, 
And then I decided that didn't sound like very scholarly at all. So I, I went with this uh, slightly stuffy, but uh, in, in some ways more accurate, the complex relationship between basic science education and public policy. Um, so as, as Keith said, I started my uh, academic life as a basic researcher. I studied um, the consequences of learning for the brain. So what, what, happen, what, what brain changes occur as a consequence of learning. And did that for about 10 or 15 years and, and then got interested in applications. So thinking about the relationship between basic science and how it gets applied in the classroom is of course very natural to me. So uh, tonight I'm gonna try to bring you uh, some, some th thoughts on that that I hope will uh, be, il be illuminating. And this little guy, okay, that works. Uh, so here's the basic outline of the talk. In order to understand uh, how, how, we're, how to do this better, we first need some theoretical backdrop on the relationship between basic science and applied science. That's gonna be a problem. Uh, so we'll, we'll start there, uh, and then we'll talk about what science can and can't do for education. The sort of understanding in uh, the, the theoretical uh, relationship between these two will be, put us in a better position to talk about what science can do, and also think it's enormously important to be clear about what science can't do for education, and I'll get to why I think that's so important a little bit later. Uh, and then, I'll, th this is where the, the, the plea part of the talk came up, why research currently doesn't really matter in conversations about education. Uh, especially as it relates to policy, and then uh, finally, some thoughts on how research can perhaps be made to matter. Okay, so let's start here. Basic science versus applied science. If you've thought about this issue at all, or if you've never really thought about it very carefully, th this is probably the cartoon version of what you think the relationship is. This is what most scientists think the relationship is. So scientists are doing basic research. So research that doesn't really have any thought of application. We're just trying to figure out how the world works, and we're not really worried about whether it's doing anybody any good. That doesn't really, that's not our department. Um, but the people who are interested then we'll do some, they'll take those findings and they'll do some, some fine tuning of it and they'll sort of particularize the basic research, they'll exploit it in some way, and then they'll finally develop a product. Um, this basic view didn't, hmm. we'll get to those guys in a second. Um, I gotta learn how to get this guy under control. Uh, so this, this view didn't come out of nowhere. This actually came um, from Vannevar Bush, who was the director of wartime office scientific research and development. So this was the guy during World War II who was overseeing all scientific research uh, that was uh, part of the war effort during the Second World War. As the war started to wind down and it sort of looked like the Allies were probably gonna win, uh, President Roosevelt asked Bush to write uh, write him a memo about what ought to happen to, war, uh, to funding levels for research when the war ended. And Bush made a very strong case that funding, the federal government should continue to fund research at, at uh, very high levels. And he said this was essentially the reason why. You've got basic research and then you've got applications of basic research and the basic research really provides the fuel for the application. So you don't want to cut off funding for the basic research. There's enormous good that can come out of it. At the same time, as you saw as a hint here, uh, this, this reminds me of the underpants gnomes, this, this general outlook of the relationship. So if you don't know, if you're not familiar with South Park, the underpants gnomes episode, what happened was there was um, a little boy who swore that his underpants were being stolen at night by the underpants gnomes. And so the friends go and uh, stay up all night, and lo and behold, there really are gnomes stealing his underpants. And so they persuade the gnomes to take them back to their underpants processing facility uh, to uh, sort of ex ex so they can see for themselves what's going on, and they demand to know, you know, why are you doing this? How can this possibly be helpful? And they show them the business plan. And this is the business plan that they, that they show them. Phase one, collect underpants. Phase two, something else happens. And then phase three, profit, right? This to me feels a lot like the, applied, the relationship between basic and applied science that I just showed you, right? It's, the idea is in phase one, we study the brain. In phase two, something happens. And then phase three, somehow education gets better. 
Right? So the second phase is really underspecified. It's not at all obvious. We have very few guidelines as to what we're really supposed to do here in, by way of taking advantage of this stuff here. Lots of good stuff happening here, but there's no real guidance about how we're, we're supposed to uh, uh, take advantage of it to improve education. Here is an alternative view. This comes not from Vannevar Bush, but from Herb Simon. Simon was a uh, cognitive scientist. He was a pioneer in artificial intelligence. He won the Nobel Prize in economics. So he was sort of a polymath who contributed, really did foundational work in many different fields. Um, and he offered a different view of the relationship between basic and applied sciences. Uh, and here's what it looks like. Here's the, the distinction that he draws is sort of similar to the one that Bush draws. He says, look, you got natural sciences. What you're trying to do in natural sciences is discover laws that describe natural phenomena. That's it. So in that sense, natural sciences are descriptive. All you're trying to do is describe what the world is like. This contrasts with applied sciences. In, that, in, in applied sciences, natural law and human purpose come in. Right? So you have a goal. You, you're not concerned with what the world is like. You want the world to be a better place. You're trying to change the world. Right? So in that sense, it is normative. Right? You're concerned with how things ought to be, not how things, initial, uh, how things are now. So examples of applied sciences would be all the branches of engineering, economics, urban planning, education. Right? A key feature of applied sciences is that they usually or almost always entail the creation of an artifact. You're making something. So in engineering, you're building a bridge. The world is not as, as I want it to be right now. I want to be able to get across the river, so I'm going to build a bridge. In education, children don't know everything that I want them to know, so I'm going to create a curriculum. I'm going to create a lesson plan, right? So again, there's the creation of an artifact that is going to try and uh, help you achieve this goal that you've set out, right? And again, the goal is absolutely crucial. You, you're, uh, you want the world to be different than it currently is. Now, Simon further draws a distinction or a description of the artifact. So when you consider the artifact, he talks about an inner environment and an outer environment of the artifact. So as you can see by the definition here, the inner environment is the components of the artifact. It's sort of the inner pieces of the artifact. The outer environment are the characteristics of the environment in which the artifact is situated. Okay. So for example, if you're trying to create a timepiece, the inner environment could have, uh, take a number of different forms. If it's a pendulum clock, you would have gears and springs in a pendulum. If it's a digital watch, you would have microelectronics. If it's a sundial, you might you have marble, for example. Now, the outer environment is absolutely crucial when you think about the, uh, uh, the, the relationship between the artifact and, and how well it's working. So for example, the pendulum clock is going to work marvelously when it's sitting here on a mantle. But the pendulum clock is going to not work at all on board a ship because the rolling motion of the ship is going to render the pendulum inoperable, right? So it's not enough to just know what the inner environment is like. You also need to know, understand the environment in which it's situated. So you've got three things you're thinking of simultaneously. You're thinking about how well the artifact meets the specified goal, and that is dependent on the inner and the outer environment and how they relate to one another. Okay, so this is Simon's description of how applied sciences operate. And crucially, here's how natural sciences make their contribution. Natural sciences contribute to applied sciences by describing the inner and the outer environment. That's where they end up being useful. They can tell you that certain properties of the, uh, what, uh, how the inner environment ought to operate, and likewise for the outer environment. So for example, if you are an architect uh, designing a skyscraper, you're concerned with the inner environment, you're concerned with the laws of mechanics and material science. Those are obviously going to be relevant as you're considering how to build a tower that is going to stay up, that is going to bear the load that you intend for it. And then the outer environment, you're be, you'd be concerned with things like what the, what the uh, 
maximum winds are that the uh, tower will have likely have to withstand in that area, and so you need to uh, build the tower to be able to uh, live in, the, in that environment, operate effectively. Okay, so that's the first piece. Now we've got in place some sense of, uh, I think, a more fruitful way of thinking about the relationship between basic and applied sciences. We've gotten much more particular about how basic and applied sciences relate to one another, Instead of the sort of obvious and not very helpful, well, applied sciences can make use of basic sciences. We've been much more particular about where natural sciences or basic sciences come in. They're going to come in in the description of the inner environment and of the outer environment. So how does this help us think about education and what uh, natural sciences might be able to do for education? Well, in this framework, it becomes obvious that there's, there are some problems here. There are some challenges. Uh, to ways that natural sciences are going to be useful. Uh, here is the first one, which I would call the goals problem. One of the things we said is that goals are absolutely intrinsic to applied sciences, right? You really, you don't have an applied science without a goal. We said this is, natural science is just trying to describe the world, but applied sciences, inevitably, there is a goal entailed here. You, have, uh, you, you say the world is not as I want it to be. Well, how do you want it to be? Right? There's no scientific answer to that. This is a question of values. Right? This is a question of what, you fit, what your vision is of, of how the world ought to be. In education, goals are really up for grabs, and people very seldom talk about them. Most of that partly because it seems kind of self-evident and partly because they're usually pretty charged and you know, you get, people get angry when you start talking about goals. So here's a list of, of goals that you could have that you could name to instill a body of knowledge and standard subjects, facts, concepts, how to use them. Most people would agree with that. Once you start getting more particular, like why is it that kids want to learn history, then you can very quickly get into goals fights there as well. Some people will say kids should learn history so they can be, uh, in order to be patriotic. Other people would say, no, kids should learn history so that they can be uh, intelligent challengers of people who are in positions of authority. Right? Very different views of why you would want to learn history. Uh, to inculcate a love of learning, to adjust the abilities of different students, to foster creativity. All of these I, I, I put up there as things that you would say, well, these are, f lots of people would probably agree with these. These in italics are ones that you less often uh, get lots and lots of agreement on. Develop a good character, to, develop, uh, to build a moral sense, to develop loyalty to one's country. Turns out historians tell us that prior to the Civil War, these were seen as the goals of schooling. This is what school was really for. This other stuff, like learn, if you learn something along the way, that's nice, but that's not really what the point was. The point was these other things, right? So goals really are quite flexible. And again, if you uh, uh, are, have this vision that goals are absolutely essential in thinking about uh, making use of natural sciences in an applied science context, you recognize you've got to define what your goal is. Uh, so we got a problem in education. Okay. Um, the second problem I'm going to call the feedback problem. When you think on, well, once you start thinking about what your goals would be, you realize that, okay, uh, the whole point of this enterprise is that I'm trying to change the world so that I can be, the world can be closer to this goal that I've set. Now, in the case of something like building a bridge, it's very obvious whether or not you've met that goal, right? Can I now get across the river? Did the bridge fall down, right? Things like that are very effective feedback. Uh, and feedback's absolutely essential, because if I do something like I create a new curriculum in the belief that I'm now going to be closer to my goal than I was before I implemented this curriculum, well, how am I gonna know whether or not I'm closer? Maybe I've actually made things worse. So if I want to do something like make kids more creative, I need to be able to know whether or not kids are more creative after I implement my new curriculum. Our feedback mechanisms are actually pretty poor in education. Right? Our ability to measure lots of the things that I suspect people in this room would say we all care about in education, our ability to measure those things is pretty bad. Right? Even something as str seemingly straightforward as critical thinking, we don't have really very good measures of critical thinking, let alone uh, uh, creativity. 
right? We've got fairly good measures in, a f in some standard subjects of what kids know and to some extent what they can do. And, and that's about it. So once again, we've, we've really got a problem here. Okay. I'm going backwards. Why am I defeated by this thing? This is so sad. <laughs> Professor Willingham, <laughs> what's this? Okay. <laughs> okay. Let's try and get back on track here. Okay, third problem, outer environment problem. Um, so one of the things I mentioned, right, is that you, uh, you, you can't just think about what uh, the, the, the inner guts of, of whatever artifact it is you've just you described, right? So you build a pendulum clock and you're really proud of it, but you've got to take into account where it is, right? Um, and we've got a similar problem here in education. So think about uh, what the inner versus outer environment might be in education. What were, what, where would natural science tell us something about sort of the inner pieces of a something versus the environment in which that something is situated? Well, the truth is we have lots of choices here because there are lots of levels at which we could um, analyze uh, edu and, uh, uh, sort of the educational situation. One is sort of the, how the child is doing. Right, so one level of analysis in education could be the child. And this, is, this is sort of what the parents say, like, how's my child doing in reading? Right, so just sort of an overall evaluation of how that child is doing. But then, of course, we could also think about the classroom as a level of analysis. Is this classroom operating effectively? Um, we could also think about a different level of analysis, which would be the school. Right? Once again, we can have theories about uh, how to run a school effectively, and we can continue to the district and even to the jurisdiction. Um, and then we can also get more particular. So we've got a child, and the, the, the parent might just say, how's my child doing in reading? Well, then if the child is maybe struggling a little bit in reading, the, the teacher is going to be thinking at a level of analysis that's lower than this. I'm going to call this an educational construct. So this would sort of be pieces of a theory of reading. Right, so things like um, a, a reading comprehension strategy or background knowledge, these would be pieces of uh, what would be a single construct up here. It gets decomposed into multiple constructs down here. And then indeed something like a reading strategy or mathematical reasoning gets down to the level of analysis where I usually live, which are cognitive constructs, more particular, uh, particularized theories. Okay. The point of this is that you've got all these different levels of analysis. Where would, where would educational theory frequently lie? Where would, um, what, where would we consider the, the intervention to lie? Well, most of the time the intervention is going to be here. We're going to be thinking about sort of the child as being, having an inner environment, right? So we're thinking about theories of development. We're thinking about theories of cognition. We're thinking about theories of reading. And all these, it's a little bit like the pieces of the clock. Right? How do these inner mechanisms work? And I'm trying to create an intervention that's consistent with the inner workings of the child's mind so that the child will learn how to read, learn mathematics, and so forth. If that's true, then the outer environment is the classroom. Here's where the problem is. In natural sciences, we know a whole lot more at this level, the level of the child, than we do at the level of the classroom. Okay. It's not that we don't know anything about how classrooms operate. That's certainly not true. But it certainly is true that our theories are, there, there's a longer history of theories. And I think our theories are arguably better developed at the level of the child than they are at the level of the classroom. There's just been more research done on that. Right? There's not the same sort of fundamental vocabulary about how classrooms operate. So here's the problem. If you need to know both the inner environment and the outer environment, and we know a whole lot more about the inner environment, we're a little shaky on the outer environment, then once again, we've got a problem, right? Because we may end up building a beautiful pendulum clock and then putting it on a ship. And that's just not going to, uh, no one's going to benefit from that. The final problem I'll point out in uh, that, that this analysis of the relationship between basic and applied research reveals is what I'll call the levels problem. And this one is, is probably the trickiest, but I'll try and make it intuitive. So getting back to um, our levels of analysis here, which, which I just showed you, it's assumed by researchers that these levels are relatively independent of one another. 
right? That they, uh, I shouldn't say relatively independent, but they, each of them sort of has its own integrity. You can study a single level without studying the levels below it, which in a way sounds a little bit weird, right? Because you might say, well, if you understand children, what is a classroom except a bunch of children? So why are you saying we need theories of classrooms? Well, when you think about it, it's kind of obvious we need theories of classrooms, right? I mean, if you, if you put it this way, I tell you, here's someone who's been a tutor in mathematics. They've done one-on-one -on -one tutoring of mathematics, and they're matchless at it. They're a fabulous tutor. They've been doing it for 20 years, and they've had enormous success. Now they've decided they're going to be a classroom teacher with 28 kids. How do you think they'll do? <laughs> well, I didn't expect there to be unseemly snickering. But yes, I agree with you um, that, yeah, it's not, it, so it's perfect. I think all of us have the same intuition, which I think is absolutely right, which is naturally this person really knows children and that, that experience and knowledge is going to be relevant. But this teacher, this new teacher is going to be facing problems she's never faced before, right? Because kids interact, right? And so new things happen as a consequence of these interactions. So this is, uh, in general, uh, if you want the fancy term, it's called near decomposability, which is how these levels relate to one another. It's one, it's a particular way of talking about the relative independence, but not complete independence, right? So again, the tutor's knowledge of children is clearly going to be relevant in her uh, classroom skills, but it's not going to be everything. Okay, so the, here's, here's where we get to the problem. The problem is, if I'm saying, Knowing everything there is to know about children doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be successful, uh, uh, completely successful in the classroom. This means that what we discover at lower levels cannot reliably be counted on to propagate up. Right? That's what I just said in the case of the tutor. The same thing applies for knowledge that we gain down here. Right? So, Anything, things that I learn in the laboratory about how cognition works may or may not apply in an obvious way at these higher levels. Right? Another way of putting this is, I mean, there, there's some very simple and obvious examples of, of how this plays out in education. So as a memory researcher, I know that repetition is good for memory, but that Equal obviously doesn't mean that like, okay, kids, sit down, you're gonna repeat this until you know it, right? Because again, this, a finding from this level can't necessarily propagate up in a way that is gonna end up being um, useful. So in this case, the cognitive construct being memory does not work at the level uh, of the child's mind. The situation in which this works, we're most successful at this, is where we have very well-developed theories, and there's some areas where we do. I would say reading is probably the best example um, uh, of where we, we understand something about how these uh, levels relate to one another, right? So we've got uh, reading performance here, and we've got a really well-worked-out theory in terms of educational constructs, and then we know what the components are there. So then when I learn something new at this level, I've got a good theoretical basis to figure out how it's going to propagate it up, and I can make reasonable predictions about it. It happens sometimes uh, in, in some areas, but in many, it does not. Okay, so here's the interim conclusion. There are limitations, but there are ways that basic science can be applied to education. One is we do have some goals that are fairly well agreed upon, right? We want kid, you know, most people are on board with the idea that children should read, right? That's, that's good, so that's a starting point. We can use that as a starting point. Uh, so when we have agreed upon goals, we're good. Um, areas in which we've got decent measures, that's another place where we've got an opportunity for natural science to inform uh, applied science in particular. And finally, places where we've got a well-developed theory for the reason I just told you, or potentially where the effects are incredibly robust and we just figure they're probably just going to, they probably will apply at every level. Okay. So we can, we've got problems, but we also think that we can, we can make some headway. There's a whole other method, though. So what I've been talking about, about how you can use basic or natural sciences in applied sciences. What I've been talking about so far is where you've got this knowledge, this stuff that you know, 
and you're going to uh, take that and use it to shape how you think about the internal environment and the external, the inner environment and the uh, outer environment. Um, there's another way you can do this. When you think about it, people were building these sorts of artifacts long before there was natural science. Right? And they were doing so very successfully. This is a bridge in Rome, which is uh, still uh, functional and still certainly beautiful. It's over 2,000 years old. Right? So how did they, today we would say this is an example, this is a civil engineering project, right? And I just gave engineering as an example of, uh, of an applied science. So how can you have applied science without natural science? Well, it's fairly obvious how it is, right? This sort of trial and error. Right? You try building a bridge, the bridge falls down, you say, well, that didn't work, I'm not going to do that again. And you keep trying different methods until you successfully build a bridge. Right? So you don't have to have naturals, and likewise with teaching. People have been teaching long before there were theories of child development and so forth. So you certainly can build these artifacts that, you're, that you want, that are you're an attempt to make the world more like you want it to be, even before you have natural science. The second way that science can be applied here is that you can use the tools of science to sort of formalize uh, the evaluation of those artifacts. Right? So instead of just looking at whether or not the bridge falls down, you can use methods that were originally developed in the sciences to make more particular measures and uh, offer better, um, uh, better techniques for being confident that you know whether or not the thing has really worked. Um, so these are called randomized controlled trials, right? That's what they're called in medicine. There are certain uh, quarters in education that are calling for more and more randomized controlled trials. And basically what you're saying is, I've already got my artifact. I'm not trying to be inspired to build one. I have something, and I want to know whether or not it works. All right? So that's where you would do something like you've got Accelerator Reader, and you're going to compare that to a business-as-usual classroom and see whether it works. Or you've got two interventions. Uh, accelerated reader or this horrible pizza thing they do. And, uh, and you want to know whether, uh, whether or not one of them is, is better than the other, right? And so again, you've got, you know, we've got fancy methodologies and statistics and so forth that can give us a better answer than you can get just by, just by eyeballing the data to figure out whether or not that's going to work. Okay, so these are the three things that I mentioned before. And then we could add a second way that, uh, that, that science can help. We can uh, suggest randomized control trials. I think they're, they're useful, but they are limited because you're making a particular comparison. What you know at the end is whether the pizza thing works better or worse than Accelerator Reader. You don't know something that's, that's incredibly general, right? You know something that is, that's quite particular. And then you do have, you still have this problem. It's not obvious that the conclusion you draw is going to apply universally. Right? You always have to keep in the back of your mind that whatever, you know, there, there could be factors that are particular to the teachers or the kids or, or some other factors that you don't know anything about that mean that this is not necessarily true for all locations uh, at all times. Okay, so we've gone over the, golly, we've got, <laughs> Uh, I'm getting better, though, I think. Uh, we've, uh, we've gone over the difference between basic or the relationship between basic and applied sciences, when science can, what science can and can't do for education. So let's talk about why education research doesn't um, really matter very much. Um, I'm, I'm not going to make a huge effort to persuade you uh, that this is the case. I'm not going to present data that education research doesn't matter. If you're paying attention at all to debates about education, you know that education research doesn't have, uh, doesn't have much impact. So I'm, I'm going to skip straight to the question about why it does not have greater impact. Uh, what I'm going to suggest is that scientists in particular, so the, the people who should um, be trying to promote the use of science, there's lots of ways you can set education policy, right? There's lots of ways that um, a teacher can decide how he or she is going to teach. The way that researchers, scientific researchers, generally try to uh, persuade policymakers is argument from authority, right? They basically say, "Look, we're scientists, so you know, so that I mean, what else do you need to know? I'm a scientist, you know, shape up, right?" Um, and that really, that really doesn't work. So let me uh, break down for you a little bit how argument from authority should work. There it is. Uh, we're going to set this up in, in, in the, the way a logician would do it. Uh, you start with proposition A. Simon has a good scientific reasons for believing X. 
proposition B, Billy has good reason for believing that proposition A is true. And therefore, Billy believes that X is supported by scientific evidence. So this is a, a semi-fancy way of, uh, of setting up, and this was a logician who, who pointed this out to me, um, something that is fairly intuitive, which is Billy doesn't really understand the science, right? But Billy thinks that Simon does. He thinks Simon understands the science, and he knows that Simon believes that there are good scientific reasons for uh, that for believing X. So Billy figures that's good enough for me. X is probably supported by scientific evidence. That's argument from authority. Billy is trusting the authority of Simon as someone who seems to have scientific knowledge. That's, that's argument from authority. You are an authority, therefore I believe you. Now when you first hear this, it sounds stupid, right? You're, you're kind of like, Billy's a sucker. Why does he believe that? Just because Simon says it's true, why, does he, why, you know, why doesn't he gather evidence on his own? But when you think about it, we trust authorities all the time, right? And we sort of have to, right? So when I go see my doctor, I don't say, well, you know, I don't know. You know, you say I should do this, but, you know, I'll take your advice and then, like, maybe I'll figure something else. I'll add to it or take away from it and, like, you know, figure it out on my own. Likewise, when an electrician comes to my house, I pretty much trust that he or she knows what they're doing and trust them to fix my wiring. And when I had a deck addition, I, I trusted my architect that, they, uh, that the, the, the deck was going to stand up. So here's the question. What's the difference? Why do we trust these people by virtue of their authority? But we don't trust education researchers, or more generally, education researchers are not really trusted. What I'm going to suggest is there are important differences between people like this and people like me in terms of why they seem to be trustworthy and worthy of uh, uh, believing them by virtue of their authority versus education researchers. Okay, so here, here are some of the differences. First, in the case of the people that we tend to trust, there's a reputable body that does the vetting for us. Right? So when I see my doctor, I, I know that she can't practice medicine unless she's been uh, certified by the Virginia Board of Medicine. And likewise, when I hire an architect or an electrician, I know they're licensed by the Virginia Department of Professional Occupational Regulation. Now, of course, I, I don't know very much about these organizations at all, but I figure out probably if there were a big problem, I would know about it, right? It seems to be commonly agreed that they do an okay job. And so there's probably, I know these people are vetted and they seem to be vetted by somebody uh, who, who understands things. This is not true at all in education. No one is doing the vetting at all. And instead, what happens is people who sell snake oil sort of commandeer or appropriate earmarks of authority so that they will look like they have the type of things that we associate with authority. So this is um, a website that sells homeopathic remedies for ADHD. If you're not familiar with homeopathy, it's basically you give people distilled water and you tell them that it's medicine. Okay? It's, that's pretty much what homeopathy is. Um, and the, the things that appeared on this website are very interesting. So you, of course you have somebody in a white lab coat. PubMed is a legitimate uh, uh, website that, that is a uh, the, the compendium of medical articles. And interestingly, if you click this thing, what you see is a bunch of things on homeopathy, most of which say it doesn't work. Right? But they're sort of counting on the fact that people probably won't click. Um, and again, and then here's another earmark. Studies show that homeopathic medicine uh, stacks up with conventional medicine. And then most interestingly, they've got the seal and the, uh, the listing here, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the National Institute of Health, which makes you think somehow the federal government approves of this. The federal government is on board with this. So when I was writing uh, the book, When Can You Trust the Experts, I called the National Institute of Health and said, I'd like to use your logo. Um, and the reason I want to put your logo in my book is it's an example of this terrible website selling snake oil that is using your logo. And so it sort of filtered up through the, the chain of command. I eventually got a call back in a couple of weeks, and they said, we're really sorry. Like, you know, we, we think that, that would be a good use of the logo, but the truth is we just have this blanket policy. No one is ever allowed to use our logo except us. And by the way, what did you say the URL of that website was? <laughs> um, and indeed, I checked it like a week later, and it was gone. OK, here's another example. Just I, I can't resist doing this, because this sounds very academic. This kind of stuff's on my website. So this is a website. So before I show you the website, I'll just tell you how in the sort of about 
um, a, um, a page of this person. Here's the description. She's sort of showing you all of her uh, symbols of authority. So she tells you about her degrees. She tells you she's presented her research at international conferences. She's been interviewed for nu numerous magazine articles. She's appeared on television. She's the author of two books which have been published in 11 languages, right? So here she's sort of showing you, you know, I'm an authority. You should believe me. I, other people have vouched for me. I seem to be an important person. Um, this is what the website is. This woman communicates telepathically with dolphins. <laughs> That's what she does. Okay, so again, there's this sort of idea, anybody, especially with the web, you know, anybody can sort of present earmarks of authority. In case you miss it, yes, this does say Sasquatch. Okay, there's, a, there's a Sasquatch link on her website. Okay, so, so we got a problem, okay, in terms of Again, so big picture, what are we talking about? Why are education researchers not really believed? What I'm arguing is education researchers expect to be believed by virtue of our authority. We expect people to say these are you know, researchers and they're, it's science and so forth. And I'm outlining differences between us, education researchers, and uh, authorities who we generally trust. So one difference is we trust people when there's a reputable body that does the vetting. In education, no one vets. And in the marketplace, everybody appropriates earmarks of authority, right? So what ends up happening is there's really no way of validating who's a legitimate authority, or maybe not no way, but it's much more difficult to validate who's a legitimate authority and who's not. Second difference is that in when we trust um, authorities, it's usually the case that we perceive that there's sort of a settled truth in the discipline. Okay, so for example, I thought I had it under control. So these are, if you can barely see it, this is the inside of someone's gum. These little white spots, these are called coplic spots. Coplic spots appear 24 hours before full-blown measles, before you get the rash, right? And so we sort of see, and physicians will tell you that it's, it's not really uh, this direct, but we, we think most of medicine is like this, that there's this very straightforward relationship between symptoms and disease and that uh, a competent physician knows what these relationships are. So again, there's sort of a settled truth, right? There's, the reason I can trust your authority is I don't think there's a whole lot of room for opinion in this, right? When my electrician comes to fix my thermostat, I don't say, so who are your greatest influences as an electrician? Like, you know, who really moves you as an electrician, right? I just figured there's a right way and a wrong way to fix my thermostat, fix my thermostat, right? And so I'm willing to sort of figure, if you're an authority, you know the body of knowledge, and that's it, right? And, and that's good, that's, that's what I want, you can be trusted. In education, that's really not true at all, and I think schools of education are really part of the problem here, or part of the challenge. Because in schools of education, you have people from wildly different disciplines. Right? So you've got people from political science, sociology, so psychology, philosophy, people trained in critical theory, women's studies, economics, history. Now, it's not to say these people don't all have valuable contributions to make, but these people disagree on what constitutes persuasive evidence. Right? That's intrinsic to their fields. These people have different definitions of what it means to know something. Right? So it's not surprising that they very seldom have consensus views. It's not like you can go into most schools of education and find issues on which absolutely everybody agrees, everybody is on board. Uh, and so the, uh, and, and here's, a, here's a, a, a nice quotation. Uh, from Clark Glymore about uh, how interdisciplinary work uh, works, which I think captures, captures things pretty well. There's sort of this, vi you know, this vision that's like, it's going to be fantastic. We're going to put all these people who care about education and kids together, and they're, you know, they're, there's going to be this beautiful flowering of interdisciplinary work. Anybody who's been in an interdisciplinary context tell you it's more, it's more frustrating than anything else. It's very hard. You talk across purposes for exactly these reasons. You have different definitions of what constitutes evidence. You don't know quite how to make, what to make of how they think about problems and so on. It takes a lot of work. It's not that it can't be done, but it's not nearly as easy as it, uh, as it initially might seem. You see this also in the American uh, Educational Research Association, which has special interest groups for people who are you know, particularly interested in particular approaches to education. 
So these are just some of their, like 140 of these or something. So you've got people studying narrow, uh, narrative research. You've got the brain people. You've got the Marxists. You have the applied research in virtual environments for learning. So these are sort of techie people. The Confucianism, Taoism, and education. You got Foucault, you got Min, then you got this particular uh, uh, version of statistics. So imagine trying to get you know, the Marxists and the Foucault people on board with the brain people and the, you know, the linear regression people. This is not in the cards, right? These people have very, very different visions of, uh, of what evidence should, should look like, and the spirituality people. OK, so what's the problem you end up with? Here's our logical form again. Simon has good scientific reasons for believing X. Simone has good scientific reasons for believing not X, whatever the opposite of X is. Right? Billy has equally good reasons for believing that proposition A is true and that proposition B is true. Right? So when you've got people who, both of whom seem to be legitimate authorities, um, and they're saying exactly the opposite things, you end up thinking, well, there's not a settled body of knowledge here. This is not like medicine. This is not like um, uh, what my electrician does. Uh, it's, it's what, what I perceive here is that researchers squabble and they change their minds. Right? And so I don't see much reason, and I can't tell you how many times I've heard this from teachers who say like, well, yeah, I mean, I know that's what you say, but then someone else tells me the opposite, and you know, tell you the truth, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna kind of figure, figure it out on my own, because it's not clear to me that researchers really have got this one worked out. The third difference between um, fields where we are ready to trust authorities and fields where we're not is what, we, what the, the intended role of the consumer is. Okay, so if I go see my auto mechanic and my auto mechanic tells me, oh, you need to change your oil more or something, uh, or I see my doctor and she tells me you need to be on a low fat diet, um, I sort of figure my job is to do whatever it is they say if I know what's good for me. Right, so I'm really surrendering a lot of autonomy to them. Naturally, if it's something major, I might you know, go get a second opinion or something like that. But I sort of recognize I should really do what this expert says if I know what's good for me. Right? It's not a good idea for me to go to my mechanic and say, that's a really good idea. And, you know, let me, how about I get in there and help you and turn a few screws and see what happens. Right? Or likewise, you know, say, again, say to my physician, that's an interesting idea. I'll use that as like, you know, inspiration for my own homegrown uh, health, uh, health plan that I'll, I'll try and cure myself. That seems like a really bad idea. Teachers are not ready to do that. Right? Teachers are very concerned about their autonomy. This is a scripted lesson. Uh, and so the truth is, teachers are leery of surrendering their autonomy to uh, researchers. They don't see persuasive evidence that they should act the way most of us act when we see a physician. That if I, I understand that, bottom line, what's good for me is listen to what you say and try my best to do it. Right? Okay. So, in summary, part, I think a, a big part of the reason we've got a problem, why education researchers have a problem and no one listens to us, the plaintive uh, version of my title. Researchers expect authority to be persuasive, but we don't have in place the conditions that are necessary to speak with authority. All right, what can we do to make things better? How can we make research more relevant? Because again, in the second, second segment here, I said I think science really can do, do some things that would, uh, that would be helpful. There are restricted areas in which, where I think it would be good if policymakers and teachers uh, did listen to researchers more. There are things we know. What can be, uh, how can things be made to matter? So I'm going to suggest three things. The first of these is in uh, concerned schools of ed. So here you see silos, and silos is, is the term that's frequently used about different disciplines. Silos are deemed to be bad. You don't want silos. So in other words, this is where the cognitive psychologists sort of only talk to the cognitive psychologists, and the economists sort of only talk to economists, and the historians only talk to historians, right? This is the opposite of interdisciplinary research, that what you want is uh, everybody talking to one another. I think actually it would be really helpful if we make clear what different approaches to knowledge can do and can't do. Okay? Exactly the sort of thing I was doing at the front end of this talk. I was saying there's certain things I think science can help with. There are other aspects of problems in education that are uh, absolutely essential, and science is going to be silent on these things. We can't, we can't help at all. Um, education researchers, I think, are actually sort of terrible on this, which is we, uh, we 
we kind of figure we know what's going on in lots of different arenas, right? And so we, we sort of freely answer questions about things we don't really know very much about. Um, so, uh, and I, I, I sort of had my Paul on the road to Damascus moment, like the, where the scales fell from my, and I realized that I was uh, guilty of this. Some reporter called me, and there was a charter school in, uh, in the Bay Area that was failing, and there was a big brouhaha about it, and the reporter called me for my opinion. And so I start thinking about it, and then I'm like, and I said out loud to him, I'm like, I'm a cognitive psychologist. Like, I don't know anything about charter schools. I don't know anything about what's going on in the Bay Area. Why are you calling me? And the poor guy was like, you know, you're just some dude on my Rolodex. Like, he didn't really know I was calling him. Um, but I realized, like, you know, we should sort of stick to our own knitting. It's actually really hard to do because, you know, if someone asks your opinion, academics in particular, like, we kind of figure we like pretty smart about most things. So we're like happy to give opinions, but it's, it's really not very healthy. So what I think ought to happen is people, people within schools of ed ought to get together who are sort of like-minded in terms of what the methods are that we value, what the goals are that we take to be important in education, what problems we think we can address, and what problems we think we can't address. Right? So you can do interdisciplinary work. I mean, there, there are certain fields that are not cognitive psychology that is very easy for me to uh, to talk with and, and, and collaborate with exactly because we're sort of all on the same page when it comes to this. This would make it easier for consumers, right? Because what we're doing is I'm basically saying all that stuff that I've been elaborating on during this talk that's really important to how you use basic research in education, all, what I'm saying is lay all that on the table and say what your choices are. Right? Say what you can do, say what you can't do, talk about the methods that you think are important and what those methods can actually accomplish and, and what, you, what goals you think are important. So that's, that's one thing that I think might help researchers be taken a little bit more seriously. The second thing is that there need to be institutions that will communicate research to teachers uh, and ideally to policymakers as well. Education may be unique in this respect. Education is not unique in the following respect. There are lots and lots of fields where there's ongoing research, it's all very exciting. Practitioners go to school and learn the latest research, and then they go out into practice. Now here's where education becomes different. In most fields that have that characteristic, where the research is still ongoing, you got a problem for practitioners. How are practitioners supposed to keep up? In most fields, it's not up to the practitioners to keep up. There are institutions that have been created that specifically are designed to make sure that the practitioners are up to date on the latest research. In education, teachers are left to fend for themselves. Right? It's up to individual teachers and administrators to sort of figure out what's, what's happening in research these days. Right? And there's not an institution that sort of, I mean, in medicine, they literally publish yearly summaries. They're reliable sources that will publish yearly summaries so that you know, okay, the, you know, the way we treat that is still the same, but look, this has changed, that sort of thing. Right? There's nothing like that. Now, how would that get communicated? Well, the natural group to do it would be professional organizations of practitioners, namely teachers' unions. Teachers' unions have shown no interest in this at all. Right? They're not, this is just not something that they see as part of their mission. Um, the AFT is, is more interested in this than the NEA, and they do professional development. But in terms of sort of the, doing these periodic, you know, yearly research summaries or something like that, they have not done it at all. The ARA, this is laughable. They're never going to, they're not interested either, but they couldn't do it if they wanted to. The federal government has tried to do it, this, or at least they tried part of it, right? This was the What Works Clearinghouse. It really failed. And it failed for some reasons that it wasn't executed very well. Also, it was really only part of the solution because there, remember the, there were, I said there were two ways of using basic research, right? There's knowing the natural science and applying it, and then there's the bridge business, right? They were only evaluating the bridge. So they were taking curricula that were already commonly in use and saying whether or not there was any good evidence for them. So they're only addressing half of the problem, and then they, they, they didn't do, they didn't do that, that good a job with it. Okay. So what I think, pro if this is going to happen, there's going to have to be a new institution uh, created to do it. Because not, as I said, none of these guys have really been interested except the federal government. And they, they, it didn't work out all that well. 
Uh, so there, there needs to be a new institution. Ideally, researchers would take the lead on this and then a lot of uh, teachers would be involved. And it would be, it would be seen as impartial and fully committed to the scientific approach. Again, sort of saying, we're sticking to our knitting. Here's what we can do. Here's what we can to do. We use the scientific method. Here's what we think, how it helps. Uh, I mentioned this, I'm actually involved in a project to try and make this happen that will be initially at least uh, restricted to mathematics, but we're, we're, uh, I and some other people are, are trying to make this happen. So that was like shameless self-promotion. Um, and, and buy my books also, they're out science. And I've got hats and DVDs in the trunk of my car out in the parking lot, so you can buy those too. Okay, third thing that I think is really important is change the narrative for teachers about what research is supposed to do. The, the, the narrative that's most often invoked is medicine, right? That teaching is sort of like medicine. And there are weird things about the metaphor in the first place, because it's like, so the students are patients? Like, I don't really get it. But there, you know, this, this sort of general idea that yes, you could use research and so on. The problem is that medicine does feel like it has this property that it's very prescriptive. Right? And again, physicians will tell you it's usually, you know, it's very often not that prescriptive. But most of us, you know, uh, people who are not physicians sort of figure like, you know, if I've got a bacterial infection, you're going to give me an antibiotic. And if you don't, you're a bad doctor. So that feels creepy to teachers, right? Because it feels like the goal here is we work out the perfect method and then you have to do that. Right, so this is a terrible method, because I don't think that's in the cards for science, or not a terrible metaphor. That's not what science is gonna do anyway. And so I've suggested a better metaphor is architecture. So in architecture, there are certain rules from basic science that you have to respect, otherwise the house is gonna fall down. Right, but once you respect those basic rules, this, the basic rules do not tell you how to build a house. They tell you certain properties that the house had better have. And then also there are certain sort of standard techniques. You have standard problems that arise in architecture. You've got a brick wall. You're contemplating putting a, a big hole in the wall for a window. Well, how do you make sure that the, the wall doesn't collapse where you put the hole? Right? That's a standard problem that's going to come up. Uh, and there are standard solutions for that. So what I've suggested is that, you could, that the, the contribution of science is going to be limited, just like it is in architecture. But we may identify a few critical features, which I've called much must-haves. So this is sort of like principles from material science, principles of physics that an architect has got to know. Otherwise, the house is going to fall down. And then a few techniques you could use, but you don't have to. Right? So the same sort of idea, common problems that come up frequently. I'm putting a hole in a wall. I don't want it to collapse. Other people have come up with standard solutions. You can imagine the same thing being true in education research, that there are um, sort of techniques that other people have found that solve certain problems that come up frequently. So I, I offer this as what I think could be a, a more effective metaphor that would make teachers uh, less concerned about this idea that the, the in the end, science will end up being very prescriptive for practice, which I don't, which I don't think it could be or ought to be. Uh, so those are my thoughts on, on how research can be made to matter. I hope that um, I've given you a, a slightly different way of thinking about the relationship uh, between basic research and applied research, and applied research as, a, uh, uh, as we see it in education in particular. Um, and in closing, I'm, I'm going to put up some contact information. I'm always very happy to, to communicate with people uh, via email, Twitter, and so forth. And thanks very, very much for your attention.